people agreed that a known resource for the EU budget there will be it will be based also on the amount of non-recycled plastic packaging waste generated in each member state. Um, this contribution will apply uh, retroactively from the 1st of January um, of this year, as soon as member states ratified that decision. Um, when considering alternatives to packaging made of virgin plastics, what also matters is sustainable management of all the natural resources and primary raw materials, and also of single market um, for high quality secondary raw materials. Recycled materials are currently the best alternative feedstock that we have, but uh, by decreasing our dependency on important natural resources, recycled materials also increase our resilience and reduce our dependencies. And that's really, really important these times. Um, with the Single-Use Plastics Directive, which you may have heard of, the EU has for the first time set the mandatory targets for the use of recycled plastics in products. So this is the first time that we're doing that with a horizon of 25 and 2030. And the reactions in the market, for instance, the price increase for food grade recycled PET, give a very clear indication that it's been an effective measure. Uh, so we will come forward with uh, proposals for mandatory recycled content in the areas of packaging, vehicles, cars, building, construction, and that will stimulate the demand for the recycled plastics. And of course, when doing that, we'll take into account the work that is ongoing in the Circular Plastics Alliance, and its objective to reach the target of 10 million tons of recycled plastics in new products. Because of this holistic approach that we have chosen, we also take um, action in other areas. Let me mention two. One of them is microplastics, and that's uh, really a widespread pollution that in the environment that is causing major concerns. We will make a start to restrict um, intentionally added microplastics in the programs, uh, in the products using the chemicals reach regulation, hopefully um, next year. And then in addition to this, we'll also develop measures to reduce unintentional risk of microplastics, for instance, from pellets, from tires, and the textiles. And um, there will be a uh, targeted stakeholder consultation for that, and uh, we'll uh, uh, need really the best knowledge uh, from, from, from many of you. Secondly, we will also develop a policy coherence for bio-based, biodegradable, and compostable plastics. Whether using bio-based or biodegradable plastics can result in low environmental impact requires really careful assessment. Uh, we are working on that, and we should uh, probably finalize the policy orientation next year. But when doing that, we'll also take um, uh, account of, uh, of the science. For example, the recent uh, release of the report of the group of chief scientific advisors to the Commission, which recommend limiting the use of such plastics to specific applications where the reduction, reuse, and recycling are not possible. So, uh, you know, to, 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 to end up, let me say that the Recovery and Resilience Facility, that's our investment uh, and financial uh, tool, will provide large-scale financial support to investment that can mitigate the economic and social impacts of the pandemic, will make Europe resilient, and will, be, will make us better prepared for the challenges in the future. And uh, a lot still will need to be done. And the Commission is really determined to work together with all the stakeholders and advancing circular economy, also for plastics and packaging, because that facility is meant also to be an investment into, into more circularities. We have to do this because we have really no choice, because if we don't do it, someone else will do it, while we would be damaging environment and foregoing really great business opportunities. But I'm very, very confident that in Europe, we will be... Uh, trailblazers for the rest of the world while also making our businesses profitable for that reason. So with this, I turn back to you. Hans, thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Uh, Sandeskus, for your uh, introduction of the EU perspective. Um, a lot has to be done in all the uh, sectors of our uh, e economy. That's uh, that's uh, quite uh, clear. And that's also what uh, Stietje van Veldhoven, our Deputy Minister, on Monday told at the National Conference for Circular e Economy. We're making progress each year, each year, but a lot, ha a lot ha has to be done. Um, one question for you be, before we start uh, a, a poll, and I would like to say to the audience, if you have questions to Mr. Sadaskas or to anybody else, please use the chat. And my colleague uh, sitting uh, in the room with me, uh, one and a half meter distance, of course, she will pick up uh, some, some questions. But I have one question for you, Mr. Sadaskas. Uh, 
Can you give an example uh, of uh, w w what makes you happy when uh, when you when you look at this broad field? Is there an example you can share with that and uh, which illustrate that 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 it's go going in a good direction? Oh, you're mute. You have to mute the microphone. Yeah, yeah, sorry about that. I think one example, uh, and that is uh, that comes from the older times, but quite recent, is the measures that we have collectively in Europe taken against uh, the uh, plastic bags. You, you you may remember that we you know when we used to go to the shops. Well, sometimes we still do. Uh, we just would take the roll of the plastic bags and we would just take them without thinking uh, about that. And uh, that was the product. That uh, that takes five seconds to produce. That we've been using that for five minutes or fifteen minutes, and then uh, we would be simply throwing it away. And uh, most of that was never recycled. Uh, it was either landfilled or or burnt, uh, simply incinerated. With the changes in the packaging directive on the plastic bags uh, several years ago, we've seen dramatic reduction of the plastic bags and people turning to alternatives. Uh, to reusable bags, whether plastic or not, but also to different uh, different ways of buying and and, and purchasing uh, in 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 wholesale, or you know thinking really before they they use something that is really of the single use, and that really forced us to to go into the um, action against the single use as such, and uh, okay. that led us to to the another directive that I mentioned. But to me, plastic bags is a story that is success, and uh, I'm sure that we will see more of that. Yeah, and for me as a consumer, it's uh, it, it's very well known example uh, when I'm uh, doing some shopping. Uh, I, I would like to give, give the audience the opportunity to give their reaction to a poll question, and I want to ask Eva to uh, share the screen. Please go to pollev.com and enter the password ISPT Warmte six seven three, or you can use your mobile phone and uh, text the code response to uh, to the number. And I would like to ask Eva to, to uh, present us the sheet with the uh, question. And on the top of the next sheet, you will see also the, um, the options to participate. And it takes, yeah, yeah. And I would li like to ask everybody in the audience to Choose one of the answers to on the top side. You find to respond pollev.com and then the uh, the password. And please choose one of the four questions. And if we have received enough responses, I want to ask Mr. Sadaskas to give his uh, reaction to the opinions uh, from the audience. Ah, the first re uh, response uh, has been received. So the question is thermal chemical recycling seems to be promising for the future. But how can we make sure that using this technology does not turn into more energy use? And what you see over here, it's is there a trade off between energy use and the use of uh, materials? Yes or yes or no. OK, this seems quite clear. We have now almost uh, 30 uh, responses and uh, most of the audience, more than half, say using more energy is not a problem as long as the energy is carbon free. We will uh, wait for a few more seconds if other people are able to change the um, the uh, the results of this this poll because we have uh, more than 100 people in our audience and almost half of it i think this is uh, the the answer is uh, it's quite uh, clear at, uh, uh, at the moment so the the reaction of uh, more than half of the audience uh, is that using more energy is not a problem as long as the energy is uh, is carbon free i would go back to uh, mr sadaskas and i would like to ask him is, is that surprising, this response? Um, uh, I would say uh, a bit yes, but not quite, uh, because um, 
for me, uh, that's not that much of a surprise, but let's say a, a supportive um, opinion, because I fully share uh, that that finding, and I can tell you that uh, the you know chemical recycling is is uh, let's say an emerging technology or emerging approach, um, uh, which we have mentioned in the last time was in the chemical strategy, um, and uh, we would like to make sure that it really delivers that. For now, we don't have industrial scale um, applications for that, but everybody is testing, everybody is experimenting, and I'm really really hopeful. Now, energy indeed was one of the issues there because it is quite energy intensive, uh, mostly depending on the on the path that you choose, because there are several technologies for chemical recycling as well. But uh, I'm, I'm very, very happy to see that optimism, uh, because that means that uh, your audience also believes that we are really uh, unstoppably on the path of the carbon neutrality. Um, so uh, in principle, for me, that's that's really, really good. Now, there is another uh, dilemma for the chemical strategy, can, uh, for the chemical uh, recycling, I can tell you, is the uh, the output, what it, what it produces, because this is what we need to be extremely careful about. Because um, there is uh, sometimes um, an understanding that um, we can chemically recycle plastics, which means break, breaking down polymers into monomers, into the basics of, for that, but uh, the main output would be fuel. And I can tell you that uh, what we are really interested in is not fuel, because um, uh, fuel, I think, you know, in, in the next uh, years, we'll see um, revolution in energy, you know, hydrogen, renewables, etc. I'm not quite sure we need fuel um, to burn anymore. What we need is the feedstock that will be produced from the chemical recycling, meaning monomers or the pure clean polymers from this that we can put back into the business. And mm. that what according to the current legislation will, will count as a recycling. If you produce fuels, it's not recycling according to legislation and we will not change this, I can tell you. So that's part of the dilemma as well, but I think it's pretty well known to many of you. And as long as we put the chemical recycling in the right place, it can have a great contribution. Thank you. Thank you for this, uh, Paul. Very useful. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Um, I'm looking to my colleague uh, Klaartje. Klaartje, uh, probably there are some questions from the audience. Yes. And yes. it's it's up to you to choose the most interesting question for uh, Mr. Sadaskas. Well, I've got two interesting ones. Um, one is a little bit related to, oh, now there's a lot of questions coming in, but I keep it to the ones I just saw. Uh, there, Bernard Ulrich is asking, what is the regulars' perspective on the recyclability issue? Current limited recycling practices and infrastructure are severely limiting in many cases. At the same time, as you rightfully mentioned, theoretical recyclability is of no benefit. How can a convergent development can be steered for development of material solutions and recycling technology? And then he asks, is road mapping an option on this? Yeah, yeah th thank you for the question. I think the complexity of the question means that there is no simple answer to that as well. Uh, but we will nevertheless try to come up with the answer. This is what we will, um, um, we have already promised that we will do, as I mentioned, for the, for, the, for the packaging. By the way, not only for plastic packaging, all packaging needs to be recyclable and reusable as well. But uh, we have also put a qualification in this. It has to be economically viab viably recyclable. Huh? Because in theory, everything is recycled. The question is, does it make sense to do it? Or is it not expensive? Or is it uh, not producing uh, secondary materials which cannot compete with the price with the primary materials? So we'll have to strike the balance and make sure that, um, that we um, make something recyclable in an economically viable way, which means that we'll have to go into the design part, you know, because that's where the core um, issue really is. How we design the products, how we make them reusable, how we make them durable, how we make them in the end recyclable. But that's really what matters. And what we will do is uh, we will not only try to uh, propose uh, the agreed rules of the game for, for the entire Europe um, in the coming years, um, uh, for on, not only for the packaging, but I also mentioned in the beginning for a number of the products, cars, Plenty of uh, plastic is in the cars, and in, in fact, increasingly more because we want light and performing cars. So we have to recover well the plastic that, that is there. The uh, construction materials, now we simply demolish uh, buildings and we send uh, a lot of uh, plastic uh, from those buildings into incineration or to landfill. You know, Netherlands may be a bit of an exception, but a, you know, a lot in Europe is happening like this. 
Um, and in general, on products, whether it's electronics, toys, furniture, anything, everything has to be um, in that in, goes in that has to go in that direction. So that's really our path for that. And uh, the road mapping indeed will have to have some kind of a path in the future because we cannot do it in one go. We'll have to give ourselves time. We'll have to invest. We'll have to come up with new technologies. But I'm very, very confident that these technologies will be there. In fact, they're already out there, but we need to scale them up and to give them the market and the scale to make them pay back. Okay. Um, design for recycling is very important. Do you think that the progress the industry is making in design for, uh, design for recycling is going fast enough to beat the problems we have? Not really. Um, and uh, I, know I understand why. Because um, uh, the business is quite investing into design for recycling. What they are telling to us is uh, is that um, sometimes it's um, it makes their products more expensive, and the reason for that is that the uh, end of life treatment or let's say recycling is very often not calculated into the price uh, through what we have the extended producer responsibility scheme. So this is what we want to fix and make sure that if you produce something that's better recyclable, then your final price has to be lower than something is not recyclable. So we have to adjust these prices. The other thing is uh, the demand from the consumers, uh, because um, uh, sometimes recyclability goes against durability, um, and uh, and uh, people, and especially the consumers, don't like this, um, or they may not like this, because if something is made to be recycled but just breaks down because it's designed in this way, it's not going to sell well. So we have to balance out very well uh, various parameters. But in okay. the end, I'm very, very confident that that's the only sensible path. Okay, later on in this program, we will have um, uh, Gerald Gebicher from uh, Amcor, and he can probably uh, reflect on uh, on this. I would like to ask uh, Klaatje if there's another question uh, from the audience. Uh, yes, well, we have a few, uh, and I would like to point out that we'll try to answer all questions at a later stage. But one is to you uh, from uh, uh, Chris Panes. Um, do you expect that we can close the loop 100%? So how do you see that future at the end of the roadmap? Yeah, 100% um, uh, is difficult, although I can tell you that in some uh, value chains, we have already pretty good recovery uh, rates. For example, in cars, at least in Europe, uh, the recovery is pretty high, but not as high as we can. But in other parts, and I think that the classical example is the plastic packaging, is the recovery rate and the, 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 the loop, let's say looping in rate is rather low. And this is what we need to push up uh, rather high. In theory, indeed, we may still need, um, we, we may still need, I mean, we will need uh, virgin materials and there will always be outlets because for the plastic, everybody knows that you can recycle it, uh, you know, a handful number of times, but only that. And after that, it gets down cycled. So, you know, what's the solution? Is solution the technology, the polymers? Is solution the business model? Is solution the material? Or is solution the consumption reduction? So, so you know, it's many parameters that play at the same time an equation with number of variables and the nodes. So mm -hmm. I would say 100% no, but we have to try for that. And whoever gets the highest number should be the winner in mm -hmm. the market. Okay, thank you very much. I think, Clark, you one last question. Um, yes, there are two about microplastics. Uh, one on. was, uh, yeah, one second. Uh, do we know which is the main source? And the other one is more, well, we can we find the latest regulation or ideas targeting for reducing microplastics in the water? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, there are two types of microplastics that we are dividing up. Uh, one is intentionally used. So, for example, you put that in shampoo, in toothpaste, uh, in paints. Um, you know, for you know, for certain reasons, um, and uh, that's what we will tackle very, very soon through a restriction of intentionally uh, used microplastics in products and uh, incentivize you using alternatives or no microplastics at all. Um, but non-intentional ones, uh, the three main sources is textiles, tires, wear, tire wear, and the loss of the pellets during the production process. And that's more difficult to tackle because you need separate tools and separate instruments for those three. Okay, thank you very much. Um, one last question before we go uh, to the next uh, speaker. What's your biggest concern, your biggest worry in this, uh, this area? Um, I well, I have quite many, uh, but- uh, Choose one. 
Yes, okay, but uh, one of those is, uh, is, let's say, slowness of the progress, uh, because we are really racing against the time, um, you know, for climate reasons, but not only for climate reasons. Uh, you know, you, people may have overlooked, but uh, we are facing biodiversity crisis, the loss of biodiversity on the planet to the scale, which is absolutely in, enormous. You know, we are fixated sometimes on climate, but the loss of, of, of the diversity of life is even bigger, I would say. And part of the problem is unsustainable use of resources and the pollution in the environment. And plastic, unfortunately, is, you know, it, it's not the plastic is to blame. It's the behavior of the people and the consumers, because the plastic is really, really great material. But we have to really learn how to use it uh, a lot better, a lot more intelligent like that. So my worry is that if we are too slow about this pro progress, but I'm also the same confident that people are realizing that there is no time to waste and the clock is really really ticking yeah and there's an important role for the consumer that means for you and for me and for all the other people Absolutely. how we uh, how we treat the, uh, the plastics okay thank you uh, for, for for the moment i would thank you uh, very much and i'm impressed with your broad overview on one hand and all these specific issues you know in in, in more or less in detail uh, in uh, on the other hand so thank you very much and we will come back with you later in the, in the, in the panel uh, discussion i would like to ask uh, kim to switch on her uh, camera because the next keynote speaker is kim ragaat she's a professor at the ghent university she has a degree in medical engineering and holds a phd in plastic processing and she's a strong advocate of sustainability of plastics. And I would like to uh, suggest everybody to have a look at her TED talk, which is quite interesting uh, and which gives an overview of, uh, of uh, her opinion about, uh, about plastic. Um, Kim, I would like to ask you to uh, give your, start your presentation. You, you don't hear anything? Okay. I do. I do hope that uh, Kim is uh, is uh, is able to give her, her her presentation, and she will give her perspective from the uh, from the university uh, point of view. I would say uh, about the future of plastics. Kim, the floor is yours. I think we have a problem with the microphone of Kim. I'm looking at our technician, but okay. In that case, I would um, then we will uh, come back to Kim later on. Then I would like to uh, to switch. Oh, on the other side of the room, people are working very hard in order to try to make the connection to uh, Kim. Kim, do we hear you? Okay, okay. I would uh, I would like to to change the the sequence in the program a, li a little bit. We come back to uh, to Kim later on, and I want to go to uh, Gerald Rebitzer. He's director of sustainability of AMCOR, and AMCOR is an international well-known global leader, I would say, in developing and producing responsible uh, packaging. And he's for quite a long time now director of sustainability of AMCOR, and we are very much interested in what's the view of a uh, producer of uh, packaging, and especially because the AMCOR has the uh, the aim that their packaging will be recyclable or reusable by 2025. Okay, Gerald, please um, uh, take us with you by the hand uh, in the, the the future of plastic from the perspective of your industry. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Hans. Yeah, not not a problem. And then hopefully you can sort it out with Kim. Should I share my slides myself, or is your team running it? Okay, okay. All right. Okay, please, I don't have the control. So if you yeah, go to the next slide, exactly. So um, very shortly for the people um, who don't know Amco, there's a bit an issue with the slides, but yeah, we'll manage. Um, for the people who don't know, um, so Amco is, is a packaging company 
Um, actually, we are the largest packaging company um, globally. We are the largest packaging company um, in, in Europe. We make all kinds of you know, different packaging using um, paper, aluminum and, and plastic. Um, but, um, you know, actually for, for good reasons, for efficiency reasons, for all the good benefits, uh, the majority of the material is actually plastics and specifically in the in the flexible packaging space where I will focus on mostly the, the rigid packaging we do mainly in North and South America, but flexible packaging we, we do globally on the right side, you see kind of um, some of our customers think that says a lot more than um, than presenting sing single products. Um, all of you will probably have two of our packaging in your hands every every day. Um, we have around 50,000 colleagues in 20, 250 um, factories around the globe. Um, next slide, please. Um, you know, Hans mentioned um, the, the pledge. Obviously, I think there are a lot of companies who have done a pledge to make their packaging recyclable or reusable. Some are also including um, compostable aspects and then um, other aspects um, where I'm quite proud. Um, we were the first packaging company to do that pledge in beginning of 2018. It's not so long ago, but in this whole debate, it almost feels like it. 20 years ago, I, I have to, to think, you know, you think we were the only one. Now, um, if you look at the global commitment of the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, um, there are like 470 companies from different sectors, obviously, but, you know, there's a huge drive um, on that. And um, to make the packaging recyclable, to include post-consumer recycled content, and then to work on the infrastructure piece in order to get from design for recycling to actual um, recycling in practice and at scale. Um, these are the three elements. Obviously, on the first two, we have more direct um, influence. And that's one aspect I will focus on. We already touched on, on the design piece. What I want to mention here, that this is really the top priority we have about 1,000 people working in product development, in research and development to produce um, and develop new packaging, and all of them have that in their brief. So it's, you know, they're all, um, it's kind of a guardrail to make sure that their packaging, um, what they develop, what they offer to customer to replace non-recyclable packaging is, is indeed recyclable. Next slide, please. And then when we talk about flexible packaging, um, the question is obviously, what does it mean that something is designed for recyclable, for recycling? In other areas, we, we all know things like PET beverage bottles. There was actually a standardization many years ago, and at least in Europe, you know, we are quite clear that it, first of all, it should be PET and not another plastic. It needs to be transparent. It has certain elements so that it can be recycled um, in a viable way. In flexible packaging, it's um, a little bit more complex because it's really very thin material. So actually, you can say flexible packaging scores really well on the reduced side. So you really use only minimal amount of material. You put a lot of functionality in, in minimized, in optimized material. But admittedly, you know, that also brought material complexity with it, um, which makes it a challenge for recycling. So if we look at what is makes sense to recycle from a, in a flexible packaging, and I'm here not talking about flexible aluminum based packaging or paper based packaging, you know, these are other elements. But if we talk about plastic based packaging, on the left side, you see in a very um, summarized way the requirements for mechanical recycling, where you could actually say um, we are really focusing on polyolefin. So what is PET in beverage bottles is po are polyolefin, so polyethylene and polypropylene, um, two core, core plastics 
these are the key materials in, in flexibles. Where possible, it really should be a mono polyethylene material or mono polypropylene material, which usually means at least 90% of that material. You will always have some other materials to enable the functionality. For one example, you know, you cannot make a, a coffee packaging, for instance, out of a simple polyethylene material that you would use for a shopping bag because then we did a bit the calculation, the material thickness would need to be 30 centimeters because otherwise you don't get the protection that, that it needs. And the coffee pack normally is 0.1 of a millimeter thick, something like that. So time to keep that efficiency, but make it out, uh, out of a mono material. And then on the right side, um, we already touched, um, thanks for that, on chemical recycling. On the right side, we have compiled a bit what are actually the input requirements for chemical recycling, where interestingly also chemical recycling as output, they want to replace, when we talk about pyrolysis, they want to replace NAFTA, so you're interested in hydrocarbons, and you know, polyolefins are made up of of hydrocarbons. So the target material, like with mechanical recycling, is also is also polyolefins. You have some materials that can be acceptable if there are not too many in there, like, like nylon, like polystyrene. And then you have some materials like PVC, like PET, that you really don't want in a in a pyrolysis process because either they are um, corrosive to the process or in cases like PET, they basically kill the yield of the process and then you don't get to any significant recycling rates. And quite interestingly, the requirements are pretty much um, the same, I think, which is, a, which is a good message. So we kind of know how to design the materials and that should be ready for both routes, mechanical as well as chemical recycling. And at least we believe they will coexist. If you can recycle something mechanically and you have a viable end market for that, that will probably be preferred due to the economics, due to lower energy consumption. But then if you have other applications and if you want to go into more food contact materials, then chemical recycling will be a good option. So I think the guardrails is this, you know, aligning on mono material polyolefins. And then the next slide. You, another two minutes. If, is that an option for you to finish your presentation? Yeah, yeah, I can. Um, in the next slide, um, I'll go here very quickly. This is just a primary example where in a very difficult application like retort applications um, here in terms of pet food, or you can also think about microwavable food, we, we moved from a material made out of two different plastics and aluminum foil to a mono material polypropylene um, application that really meets the same requirements and that is suitable for recycling. Next slide. Is it moving? Um, and what I want to stress at the end, it's really not only about, you know, obviously, you know, AMCO is big, we are focusing on that, um, but it's a full industry and it's a full value chain. I want to stress here or point out CFLEX. CFLEX stands for Circular Economy of Flexible Packaging, where we have over 170 um, companies from the full value chain, so from material producers, converters, brand owners, recyclers, and they are all committed to implement the same design for recyclability guidelines and then help to establish um, the infrastructure. And I think this is the, the type we need to move on the design aspect and get to the recycling aspect. And then the last slide is a bit hinting at what, what, is, really, what is really needed. You know, I talked about the, the packaging needs to be designed to be recyclable. I think the guidelines, we know what to do and we know how to do it. 
um, we need to make sure that these are adopted across the industry. So if only AMCO does it, it doesn't help. But I think we have really good buy-in via the CFLEX initiative, specifically in Europe, all the major brand owners, all the major packaging companies are fully aligned to that. And then the next step is that we also help to make the infrastructure available for collection, sorting and recycling. And that there's also that there are end markets for, for those materials, you know, talking about PCR, as was already mentioned. So also here, we need a good policy framework that drives this. And I think there are some improvement potentials and we need effective and harmonized EPR schemes across Europe because it will not work if each country kind of does their own little rule and their own recycling system. And then I think everybody will fail. But may, we can maybe pick this up then la later in the discussion. Um, you know, what are the, the missing ends to make this whole um, system work? And I, to conclude, it's indeed a race against the time if we want to meet the 2025 recycling targets. Um, the collection, sorting, recycling facilities, they have to be planned now and not in 2024. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Rebicher, for this, uh, this presentation. One short, one short question. What's the main driver? Is that government regulation or is that the brand owners? Uh... Um, it's, it's obviously both, but I would say the it's in, in Europe, it's also supported by the legislator, but I would say it's really in the end, more about what the market demand is doing, because we are doing this also in other regions like in Asia or where in, in the US, where today there is basically no regulation, but you want to be prepared and you want to have a you want to have a solution. So I think the whole industry is, is working on that change. I would say good regulation helps to make it actually faster and make a better and stronger case. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, also, we have a poll question, and I would like Eva to put the poll question on the on the screen, and I would like to ask everybody to give their reaction on the question: investing in design for recycling versus investing in collection and recycling infrastructure. And then there are three options for your reactions. Please go ahead, audience. Uh, at option B, one answer. Oh, no, it disappears. Okay. What was drawn? Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> I, th I think the opinion of the audience is, uh, is quite uh, uh, clear. Uh, Eva, uh, I I uh, uh, that, that's my last c c question, uh, Mr. Rebitzer, be before we uh, continue with uh, Kim Rachert. What's your uh, reaction uh, on the response of the audience? Do you recognize it or is it surprising for you? No, I have to say, in, in all honesty, it's been a bit of a rhetorical question. I, I think obviously the, the third answer ma makes sense. Um, but even the first answer, I think that change needs to happen. Um, you know, I'm, I'm really glad that there was not um, a lot of zero support for the for the second one. But I have to say, in reality, we are often faced with that dilemma, even with customers or with brand owners. When you say, okay, we want to make those changes you know that requires innovation that may cost something that also requires changes at the customer people think we change to another plastic what's what's the big deal but you know machinery filling machinery so the whole value chain needs actually to change quite a lot and sometimes you get to the question um, if I take the example of you know it's now outside of Europe out of EU UK yeah, we make that change. We now have the design for recycling, um, but it's not collected for recycling in that country. So, so why why should we do it at all? And I think that that's the key. We, we absolutely need to do it. 
because it's also a chicken and egg question, because the, otherwise the recyclers also, why should we establish an infrastructure if everything that's put on the market, we cannot use it. So it, it's really, I think, and it takes some time. There's a time lag. You cannot switch in December 2024 or in 2029. Okay, now we, we switch to the other material. So the point is indeed to work on, on both aspects and um, and push both with with urgency and make let's say make this pathway it's maybe not yet recyclable in practice and at scale yet but it has a pathway and we know what needs to happen to make it recyclable do, do you do you think and this is my last question do you think that everybody in the value chain is convinced that they have to cooperate in order to solve this problem to realize a, a new value chain on the short term no, honestly, I think most people are are always. No, I think most people are convinced. Obviously, you you have a few players on materials that are now, yeah, that now will be phased out. You you could say, mm -hmm. so um, so you have some distractors, but I think overall it's it's moving in 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 the right direction. And for me, it's like for me, I always compare it to to electric cars, you know, we, we have to make that switch. I think a lot of, if you think about the big car companies in, in Europe, they probably make very good money with the diesel engines, but in 10 years, they will not be able to sell them anymore. That's that's what I'm convinced of. And mm -hmm. in packaging, we have to say to keep those basically great properties, we have to make that change. And um, yeah, there will be always some, some outlayers, but overall, if you look at CFLEX, that represents like 80% of the market in Europe. So that's driving that change. So if I understand you well, within 10 years from now, the, the situation about uh, around plastic packaging will change uh, dramatically. If all do their in part, positive, including in the legislator and so on, yes. Um, okay. Yeah. okay, thank you very much, uh, Gerald Rebertser, from your for, for your uh, uh, your introduction and uh, answering uh, the questions. We will come back to you uh, uh, later when we have the uh, panel. And now we go back and we continue. I would say with uh, Kim Rachart again, professor at the Ghent University. And is the uh, is the sound quite well right now? I believe so. You can hear me. Oh, very clear, very clear. And. Uh, Mr. Rachat, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I would like to apologize for my technical difficulties, and I see in the meanwhile my slides have appeared. So my name is Kim Rachat. I'm a professor at Ghent University, where I have a research group on circular plastics. I'm also the academic lead of the Plastics to Resource platform within Capture, where 16 professors from four different institutes are working together on the topic of circular plastics. And finally, I'm also the 2020 Plastics Recycling Ambassador. And of course, I would like to thank the organization for inviting me here and giving me the opportunity to talk to you about this question. How do we get from the 30 million tons of plastic waste to 10 million tons of recycled content? Slide, please. So this is a bit of a visualization of our great European challenges. There's two islands. On the one hand, we have the annual 30 million ton of waste plastic generated. And the other island is our goal, not just a policy goal or a policy target, but it's also a dedicated uh, goal for the industry by the Circular Plastics Alliance. They have committed to putting these 10 million tons of recycled content in products. And in between, we have this shark infested sea, which somehow we need to be able to cross. And it's not an easy sea to cross. Today, of those 30 million tons, only a bit over five actually goes to recycling. And on the actual demand side, we're stuck at 4 million tons plastics which are uh, demanded as recycled. So we really need to start bridging this perilous sea from both sides. And that is what I want to talk about today, about which bricks we could use to build that bridge. And it's definitely not going to be an all-encompassing overview. It's not going to be a step-by-step -step manual. My goal at the start of this lengthy and very valuable conference is to actually get the discussion going and to challenge the different actors present. So I will talk about three things. And I will start, of course, with the thing about plastics. Slide, please. The thing about plastics, oh, my slides oh, have changed format, but that is just fine. Um, the thing about plastics is that they're awesome. 
Uh, they're extremely functional for near to no weight, low production costs, and they're so versatile that you can combine them to achieve almost any functionality. Oxygen barrier, have some PET. Water barrier, add some polyethylene. Want your yogurt cups to be thermoformable and also snap and break easily? Here's polystyrene for you. Want a Lego brick that will fit exactly with the Lego bricks passed down from your father or mother? Have some ABS. And of course, if it then comes to recycling, this very diversity is our main handicap. If it all comes together in the waste stream, it becomes a real challenge to bring them back to clean, high quality mono streams. And if we take the recycling point of view for a moment, actually everything which is not a monoplastic of a dominant plastic type, it's a contamination. So it's already hard enough as it is. And I understand that if we start introducing five types of new bio-based plastics, PLA, PHA, PH, PHB, recyclers do not want it. Not because it's bio-based, because it's actually irrelevant that it's bio-based, but because it adds to the complexity. If it's a minority, it's a contamination. It's as simple as that. So what should we do? Here are some bricks that I feel the industry can help light on. And please also note, none of what I say is new. Right? You, you know what I have said here. And many companies have started on simplifying things again. I think about stand-up pouches, which used to be multi-layers that can now be mono-PE. Think about in-mold labeling of the same type of plastic as the basis. Um, there's really a lot going on. And I'm also really happy um, that Mr. Rebitzer already mentioned it as well. We really need to keep the momentum, your momentum going and is striving towards simpler products so that we can generate larger volumes of less contaminated plastic of the big plastics so that we can really recycle at volume per sector. And then maybe I want to come back to these bio-based and this is a bit of a controversial little idea. But what if, uh, bear with me here, what if we own up to the fact that eventually we will be out of oil and we will need alternative feedstock for plastics? Why not gently lead up to that in a way that is as non-disruptive to circularity as possible? What if altogether we pick one type of bio-based plastic and we allow it to join the existing big five of packaging? We let it mature to become number six so that there is a significant volume and it becomes economical to provide a recycling route for it. Let's lay down the egg so that the chicken will build the recycling facility. Give the idea a chance, just keep it somewhere in the back of your mind. Slide, please. This brings me to the thing about recycling. The thing is, it's moving fast right now, very fast. We used to have only mechanical recycling. But now chemical recycling really is crossing its little valley of death and it is finding its way into implementation. But we have no real idea how these two will balance each other out. If today we have indeed these 5 million tons actually going to mechanical recycling and tomorrow from all of that suddenly all the clean polyethylene film is shifted to chemical recycling because perhaps the yields are better, then the overall recycling rate has not changed one bit and we're no closer to reaching our goals. So we really should ensure that they work complementary as much as possible. And that is where my side comes in, the academics. And there's again two things I would like to propose as bricks to build the bridge. First of all, we need to realize that also for chem chemical recycling, there are no silver bullets. Output quality is dependent on input quality. So we really need to develop science to improve input qualities and suitability of materials for input from all angles. I'm thinking about techniques like delamination, de-inking, decontamination, but also design for recycling really at the polymer level. Let's put additives in there that improve recyclability. Let's design our components for good recyclability really at that level, even more than we are doing today. And then secondly, what I feel that we academics should do or should be allowed to do is to build a system model that can really reflect the changes of flows and tonnages within this complex system of plastic circularity in a very dynamic way. So that if new, <coughs> excuse me, if new technologies come to maturity, we can immediately see how these flows will change in function of required qualities and output levels. If suddenly the inking technology matures, there will be a click of, for example, flexible films that suddenly becomes recyclable and then that will domino through the entire system and will have an effect everywhere. So we would really need such a beautiful dynamic model and it would need all kinds of expertise, waste management, sorting, pretreatment, plastics, different recycling methodologies, economics, business management, LCA. 
it would be a lot of work, but it can be done. And it would be an extremely powerful tool to help build that bridge. Slide, please. The final thing I want to talk about, there's a thing about policy. And the thing is that we are all looking towards it. We are all looking to rely on legislative frameworks to guide us across to the second island. But too often, even with all good intentions of the legislator aside, we can't find the information we need, or at least we can't find it without an army of legal advisors, or sometimes the information doesn't even exist or doesn't exist yet. And we really need some of these things to achieve the 2025 goals, because 2025 is tomorrow. And we need clear cut, not up for discussion terminology to start with. Just an example, the legal meaning of the term recyclable is still not fixed. That is, that's actually outrageous. Eh? At least, not only does it leave the door open for a lot of greenwashing, but it is also holding back all those companies and people who actually want to do the right thing. Uh, and as has been said today already, uh, the definition should not just depend on whether you can do it in a lab. I can recycle anything in my lab, so to speak, but also if it can be done logistically and if there is a market for these products. Actually, Plastics Recyclers Europe has made quite an interesting proposal of such a more comprehensive definition. <clears throat> we need more and better standards. And actually, we need them faster than these things usually go, which is several years while we would need some of these standards today. But to make that even more complex, we also need the people who make the standards to understand that plastics are so much more diverse than other materials. Uh, it's not the same as metals, which is quite basic. You cannot just make up minimum criteria per plastics type. And there's a lot of buzz going on about minimum criteria, but you can't just do that per plastic type. Polypropylene, for example, the uses range from film to toys and furniture, which really need different properties, so also different criteria. So you need to refine that and you need to do that again in a very clear cut way. Mr. And then finally, I would like to ask you to come to your conclusion. I am coming to my conclusion. Thank you. Uh, finally, we need things to be dumbed down. Uh, we really need to take companies and especially the smaller ones by the hand, show them step by step how they can be compliant. And that is extremely challenging for things like reach versus end of waste and food contact approval regulations. Um, it needs to be more obvious. And for these bricks, I look towards policymakers and government. On to final slide, please. So if all of those actors do all of that, we can build the bridge that crosses the shark infested sea and we can make it. I'm quite convinced of that. So are the ideas I've put out there the only way forward? Of course not. And do I need you to agree with me that these are the right bricks? Not at all. You can burn my proposals to the ground if you must, but only if you are willing to work on alternative solutions to replace them. So I invite you all to get out there and to make it happen with one final slide of contact information. That was it for me. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Uh, Rachard, for your uh, view of the uh, plastic uh, uh, recycling. I would like to suggest to go uh, directly to the poll question, Eva. And we want to have an opinion uh, from the audience. What are they? The question is, oh, there are even right now some answers already. Revenue of unrecycled plastic checks should be earmarked for advancement of plastic recycling. And what we see right now is that uh, option B is the most uh, favorable uh, option. Uh, Eva, you can leave this uh, sheet on and I would like to ask uh, Mrs. Rachard to give some commands on what she sees uh, what's happening on the, uh, on the poll uh, question. Okay, I will. Um, perhaps I, I should start with framing the question. Uh, so the, the unrecycled plastic tax of uh, um, of, of 80 cents uh, per kilo of unrecycled plastic, which is quite a lot. Um, it kind of caught many people by surprise because, because suddenly it was there and a regret which was voiced almost immediately and which I support is that there were no mechanisms and today there are still no mechanisms in place that will ensure that the revenue from this tax actually benefits uh, the recycling system. Um, so therefore, uh, there's a lot of discussion going on. So it's a very interesting poll question. Um, First of all, it's interesting to see that there's not many people who say 
that it shouldn't be here. And so everybody, I think, agrees that there should be some sort of mechanism that promotes um, the actual recycling. And this is now a penalty me mechanism instead of a support mechanism. And it's also quite clear that, that people agree that we should put it over the entire uh, value chain. So we should think about plastic circularity, not necessarily only plastics recycling. Uh, if we don't need to recycle, if recycling becomes simpler, it will be advanced. So I, I agree with the audience mostly actually is that we should really, it's a value chain cooperation and you should look for solutions along the entire value chain. Okay, thank you very much. So this would all be would also be uh, your uh, answer, uh, Mr. Gaghart. Thank you very much for your uh, contribution, and we will see you later on in the panel discussion. And I would like to ask Emo Meyer to switch on his uh, camera. And Emo, yep. he is working now for 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 all his career in chemistry. He was working for DSM, Unilever, and Friesland Campina. He he has been professor at the Technical University in Eindhoven, and at the at the, uh, right now he's chairperson of the Dutch top sector chemistry. And Mr. Meyer, I would like to ask you, uh, looking from the Dutch situation. What is your reaction on the uh, on the stories we've heard earlier today? Yeah, I, I will do so. But let me start with last Monday, where we had a third national conference on circular economy. And uh, you were already referring to it, Hans, uh, with the circular economy as the, I would say, the being the overarching transition. It's clear that circular economy in a broad sense is gaining momentum with hundreds of projects at all levels in society uh, to deliver on the ambition set by what, are, what is important in the Netherlands, the raw materials agreement uh, that we should be, the targets are set 2050, fully circular society and 2030, which is only nine years from now, we should be halfway. It is very ambitious. But I think there are very positive developments ongoing there. Um, the raw materials agreement also inspired in the Netherlands for drafting transition agendas. Uh, and one of them was on polymers with recycling an important theme. This all was input also for a mission oriented cross sectoral programming embodied and and in the mission CE. Uh, and um, I'm leading this mission, Circular Economy, in the innovation programming of the Dutch government. And we had a very inspiring workshop last Monday with true entrepreneurs talking about their dreams, achievements, including plastic recycling. Uh, it was great to hear these people talking about their enterprises and startups. Um, from the perspective of the chemical industry, and let me focus on that, uh, circularity is still in its infancy. Um, and at the same time, the, the chemical industry in the Netherlands is a most important industrial clusters, uh, with the base chemical industry still dominant, about 70% of turnover. Uh, but And within the base chemical portfolio, plastics production is uh, probably the major activity uh, so this makes plastic recycling a very urgent matter for the chemical industry. It's a bit worrisome in few of the targets and ambitions I already mentioned before. Uh, a circular climate neutral, neutral society in 2050. We have the plastic pact on recyclability in packaging materials. Uh, but on the other hand, we see now much bigger initiatives. Uh, like the launch of the circular hub to turn the largest in integrated chemical site in the Netherlands, that is Camelot in the south of the Netherlands, into a fully circular site. And plastic recycling is an important project in its, in its innovation portfolio. We have seen several announcements now of demonstration facilities, and that's important. We need more upscaling for plastic recycling, mainly based on pyrolysis, SEVIC is working on that, BTX in the north, uh, and we see also established players in mechanical recycling now. These are all hopeful developments, uh, but we need many more uh, initiatives with impact, with real bigger impact to turn the tide for the chemical industry from the point of view of plastics recycling. Well, we have a couple of options to achieve a sustainable chemical sector. And of course, a lot of talks are about CCS. Um, this is a short term, short -ter term option, 
that with limited potential. Uh, we talk about electrification of crackers with renewable energy, but we all know that renewable energy will be a scarce resource, so we will face stiff competition with other players there. We talk about green hydrogen based on electrolysis, uh, but there we face the same issue. It's dependent on the availability of renewable energy. We talk about biomass. There was already a reference made to it uh, for green plastics. But they lack a bit the level playing field versus fossil resources. And last but not least, recycling of plastics. So it's a whole portfolio uh, of um, options that will make the chemical sector in the end sustainable. Uh, recycling now is far less than 10%. So when you compare this to the paper industry, the steel industry, they are far ahead of us in the chemical industry. And uh, well, it was, of course, triggered mainly by the environmental issues uh, and the related image problem of the chemical industry that we are really suffering from. And uh, up till now, and that is really an issue, virgin material is still the preferred option for the industry because of the low pricing there. So there is no level playing field really for recycled plastics and other options I already mentioned. Yes. Mechanical recycling, and then I will come to conclusions, is currently dominant in the recycling portfolio, uh, but the as yet limited impact due to the complexity of the plastic waste stream that was already mentioned in some of the talks, and but also suffering of the low price level of uh, raw materials, of fossil raw materials. Then we have the chemical recycling, uh, and I, th I would like to put emphasis on that. Uh, uh, pyrolysis alone will not solve the issue. We need a much broader program, including technologies to keep the functionalities of the plastics intact as much as possible. And then we talk about things like depolymerization, um, uh, uh, sulfur lysis in general. Uh, we have a strong knowledge base in the Netherlands. Uh, well, I mentioned here CBCC, a big platform, soft trans materials in Groningen, another big platform working on these kinds of things. CPI embarked on some new initiatives. It's all about strategic research still, so low TRL, TRL levels uh, to create the necessary breakthroughs. And um, before we can really embark on upscaling to higher TRL levels, that will take substantial time, I guess. And apart from regulatory measures, uh, fiscal stimulation we need, as sector we can follow two tracks to boost the recycling of plastics. The first one is systems integration. We need a better systems integration from waste processes all the way to designers. It was already uh, mentioned in a couple of uh, presentations today. And the plastic producers, the chemical producers, are in the middle and are well positioned to show leadership in, strong co in setting up strong collaborations between the stakeholders. I think this is a must, really, uh, to, to really give a big push to recycling of plastics. And the second one is the coordination of our research innovation activities um, at the national level, exploiting the synergies between the activities to identify the gaps, and to create a platform for bigger programs. And for example, in the context of the Dutch Growth Fund, and this will be discussed later in one of the workshops. And therefore, as top sector chemistry, together with the partners like CPI, uh, Versnellingshuis, um, an important player in the Netherlands, uh, decided to establish a national platform, plastics recycling. It's launched today. So uh, with uh, communication, React, uh, reaching out to the whole community, and hopefully you see the logo here on plastics recycling. Uh, it's now displayed in the chart, uh, and hopefully talking about these two important things: system integration and better coordination of our efforts, uh, will bring us in the, uh, the steps further uh, to reach our goals set in the Netherlands. Thank okay. you. And now back to the moderator. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Meyer. And I would like to ask the other uh, keynote speakers also to switch on their uh, their camera, because we have another 15 minutes, and I would like to do some uh, reflections uh, 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 together. 
And I must say that Mr. Uh, Sandaskas, uh, working from the EU, he had another meeting, so he apologizes uh, for uh, leaving uh, this section uh, quite early. If I hear you well, then nobody says it's not necessary to take on the short term steps towards uh, plastic uh, recycling. There has to be a lot of cooperation in the value chain. Legislation is also uh, important and the consumers and the brand owners has has also uh, 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 an important role in uh, in the pathway toward the plastic recycling. So there's a lot of agreement on what we have to do and we have to do it together. And my question is, okay, what if, if, if you all give us two suggestions in order to speed things up? And I would like to start with Mr. Uh, with Mr. Rachard. Mr. Rachard. Uh, what we, two things which we really need to do. Um, we need to throw massive amounts of money at this, at every possible level. Um, I think Gerald pointed out very, uh, very well that uh, one change in a, in a design of, for example, a packaging or a product will cascade all the way through your production lines, your packaging lines, etc. And then you need to make the correct recycling infrastructure. So uh, we need massive amounts of money, both on the level of industry investment and also towards research. I think that would speed things up considerably, yes. And, and, and do you have, is, is that the main uh, suggestion you have or is there another one? No. Um, it's been mentioned a few times, uh, value chain cooperation, non-selfish value chain cooperation. Uh, and perhaps I, I would turn it around to a, a not to do. We should, different sectors should take care not to go for um, a selfishness that is inspired by fear. Um, it's very tempting for polyolefin platforms to start uh, attacking PET platforms, for PET platforms to start attacking polystyrene platforms and all wanting to profile their own material as the one to be. You really shouldn't do that. Uh, we should go for a circular system with uh, places for many, maybe not for all, uh, in there, but we really should not try to cut ahead of uh, of each other. Okay, thank you very much. Mr. Rebic, so what would, would be your two suggestions in order to speed things up? Your microphone, you're on mute. Um, thank you. Um, the one part um, is, is, you know, what, what I mentioned in my last slide, this harmonization and clear guidelines because you know what where i see a barrier to change is like i said in the last slide that there are different rules in, in different countries where where it will go um the the rules or the standards within single countries sometimes they, they change um every six months without clear evidence even and um, sometimes you call somebody up why was that change yeah somebody did some research, but you don't have any hard data. So I think this, this clear, um, this clear, um, you know, harmonization. Hopefully, the essential requirements that work will will clarify that, and then have this. What I said a bit this pass. Maybe it's not yet recycled, recyclable because the infrastructure for that is not does not yet exist, but it has a pathway, and then to incentivize. That and maybe if if, I, if I'm allowed to to add, um, you know, Kim mentioned, yeah, we need a lot more money. I would say a lot more money for collection and setting this up because honestly, that's the most costly element in the whole system. It's collection, and people like to talk about new sexy technologies, but in a way, what doesn't get collected doesn't get recycled, and that's the that's the base, the hard work that just needs to be done. It's simple to do, but it needs just, it, it costs. Okay, thank you very much. Mr. Mayer, what would be your two suggestions in order to speed things up? Now, I already made some remarks in my talk about this, so, but for me, there's an, a crucial one, and I'm still talking about from the perspective of the chemical industry. I think the bigger players in the chemical industry, and we have a couple in the Netherlands, should really show leadership in uh, building bigger consortia along the new value chains from waste processing to the design phase. 
Um, and that's my, uh, that is for me the single most important topic currently, apart from all the things that I already have mentioned. Okay, thank you very much. I would like to uh, to have a look at Klaartje. Maybe there are some questions from the audience uh, for one uh, person in the panel or maybe more, more persons in the panel. Yes, uh, there are. Uh, one question is, what would be a good approach to make a distinction when PCR can, can be recycled mechanically or chemically? Who would like to respond on that? Kim? I, I didn't hear the question. Oh. So. Neither oh. did I. Okay. okay. What would be a good approach to make a distinction when PCR can be recycled mechanically or chemically? Okay, I can take that. Uh, Actually, th this brings me back to this, this, this model we should be building about input qualities and output qualities. Uh, so you should be able to decide, you should know for each technology what is the required input quality and to what level of output would this give. And then couple to that also a footprint evaluation, an economic uh, evaluation and a logistic evaluation, and then make that decision. So it's, um, it's quality based, actually. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mr. If I can add to this, yeah. obviously quality based, but it should be linked to the to the market. So a lot of people are also looking for closed product loop recycling. And and obviously then you are setting the bar very high. But you know, if you have plastic packaging, let's say polyolefins, and you have a good market to displace injection molding elements for the automotive industry, for the building industry, then that's a that's a viable output. And then obviously the market has to has to work. You know, it's not about producing those infamous park benches that nobody wants. But if you say, okay, here. We are replace. We are displacing the the easier to displace materials in the first place, specifically with chemical recycle with, with mechanical recycling, and then we build a closed material loop. And we have to be very clear in other like metals. It's the same. Like an aluminum foil is never recycled back, with the exception of beverage cans into an aluminum foil. It goes into automotive other applications, replacing virgin aluminum. So we should also look at this, what's the material flow, you know, Kim alluded to this, and not ask, okay, this absolutely has to go into packaging because you create actually a huge inefficiency and even high environmental impact. So have the viable end markets and see where it can displace virgin material. Mm -hmm. okay. I agree completely with that. Okay. Thank you very much. Klaatje, do you have another question from the audience? Yes, uh, Gerald, you mentioned harmonization, but people are ask, also asking if standardization is needed. Yeah, I, I mean, that's that's part of that, obviously, you know, like the, the standard, you know, I think we are, we are making good progress on like recycling guidelines and then that should go into standardization. And then you have harmonized system, but yeah, obviously standardization is a is a key element of that. Okay, thank you very much. I, I would like to come back of, to one of the suggestions Kim made. She said non-selfish value chain cooperation, and Emil Meyer mentioned leadership. When I combine these two, and I would like to ask to reflect on that uh, to Mr. Meyer and Mr. Rebischer, do you think there is in the uh, cooperation in the value chain? Uh, e enough non-selfishness and enough uh, leadership, Mr. Rebicher? <laughs> to be honest, I'm not the answer. Uh, <laughs> Deep breath. To be honest, I, there I would, I think, I, I would follow more the leadership approach. People who who go out because non-selfish cooperation, obviously, I think in the end. I think in um, you know in in capitalism or however you want to call it, usually you get efficiency by people are somehow being selfish in in rules and that drives progress. So in that sense, where I'm sometimes a bit worried is that some collaboration can also be used as an excuse to do nothing. In some industry association, you see that everybody wants to collaborate. Okay, we we discuss further, but. But we ensure that nothing has happened. That's why, for instance, in CFLEX, um, we are we are very 
strict about it's not an industry association. It's an initiative with some common goals. And if, if some people are not happy with that, then they should just get out if they're not behind those. So not to make everybody happy, but then we, we know we, we have to go there. And um, yeah, obviously that people realize we have to solve it for the whole industry. And then that is also good for every single one. So you don't do it to help your competitors per se, obviously, but you you know it's it's going and I think yeah with some initiative I think it's it's going going very well so we need real co cooperation and not things to yeah to to look nice and to make everybody happy. Mm -hmm. Mr. Mayor, what do you think about it? Well, well, yeah, not selfish uh, collaboration does not exist in business. So let me clear let me be clear about that. Uh, what I'm talking about is uh, pre-competitive collaboration where parties have a common interest. It should be pre-competitive. So, and, uh, and that works fine because we have the examples at hand. Uh, I mentioned the electrification of crackers, where we have now built a consortium of six companies working on the main principles for electrification of crackers. And we see it also in the recycling of plastic. So it's not about competitive research is really about pre-competitive research uh, to exploit the to explore the possibilities for for, sustain for sustainability and that works mm -hmm. okay and 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 uh, th that's the, my fi my final uh, uh, question to you mr uh, mayor more money will speed things up is that also uh, the question uh, the, is that also valid for the netherlands yeah well of course, we have now the growth fund in place. There's uh, billions and billions of euros available. But it's not only a money issue, a money question. It's really about uh, building the coalitions of willing uh, to push uh, to push it really forward. This comes first. We need good plans, and then the money will follow. Okay. Thank you very much. That's a very clear statement. We are just a few minutes before four, four o'clock, and I would like to thank you uh, as panel members for your uh, introduction and for your uh, participation. Thank you very much. And I would like to uh, go to the uh, next part of the program and invite uh, Ronald Kostanje. He is program director of the Circular Plastics uh, Initiative uh, about the next sessions of the Circular Plastic uh, uh, Conference. So the floor is yours, uh, Ronald. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Hans. Uh, and uh, dear participants and dear speakers. Um, so I'm Ronald Gustanji. Uh, Hans uh, already introduced myself. Um, and I think um, we can look back at an interesting and, uh, and lively start of our conference. And I would like to thank uh, especially all the, th the speakers uh, and also the moderator, but also you as a participant uh, for your uh, active contribution. Uh, we have seen a quite a lively chat and uh, obviously uh, you've maybe also followed it. Uh, we cannot answer everything and we will um, uh, try to, um, uh, to make this possible also in the quests uh, as, uh, as has been uh, put forward also uh, during the chat. And which you can also find in the uh, uh, in the network app. Um, so, but there are some some highlights uh, during the conference uh, which I picked up, um, and um, uh, one of them is uh, that we need massive amounts of money, uh, but uh, especially for collection uh, because there uh, lies a, a a big challenge still. Um, and uh, leadership uh, by big players uh, for the whole value chain is, is, is very important. But try to combine that in uh, pre-competitive collaborations. And, and really, you need a, co a coalition of the willing. And uh, obviously, those are uh, not very mind-boggling uh, things, but we, we really have to uh, try to work uh, uh, according uh, those kind of um, uh, rules which, uh, which have been brought up uh, during this uh, these sessions, and um, next to that, um, uh, M. Meyer uh, introduced the uh, uh, the launching of the national platform uh, plastic recycling, which uh, is um, at least uh, uh, a, a a way to to try and build such a coalition. 
uh, and also uh, bring leadership in uh, and, and get uh, uh, new developments uh, going. Um, and so I, I would also like to uh, to address the uh, uh, the very the, the program of the um, of the whole uh, uh, conference. So this was just uh, the first session um, and just uh, actually the start of the whole conference. So next uh, in three weeks time, uh, on the 25th of February, we have uh, two uh, sessions, uh, parallel sessions uh, in March. Uh, 18th, we have uh, two parallel sessions, uh, April 8th and in uh, April 29th. And then we finalize uh, with a uh, kind of lessons learned uh, and steps to be taken uh, session. Um, so during the conference, we will collect as much as information and try to share this. Uh, and at the end, uh, we uh, try to make, uh, make some conclusions and, uh, and steps ahead for, uh, uh, for the future. OK, the next slide, please. So the uh, uh, the next set of sessions uh, is one on uh, thermochemical uh, depolymerization. Uh, this is uh, being moderated by uh, Professor Sasha Kersten uh, from the University of Twente. And as uh, speakers, we have uh, Jean-Paul Lange from Shell, uh, André Heeres uh, from uh, Hans Applied uh, University, and uh, Kevin van Geem from uh, Ghent University. And we also have a special guest there, um, uh, which will be uh, Walter uh, Kaminski, uh, Professor Walter Kaminski. Um, and uh, he is one of the, uh, the early pioneers uh, of um, uh, thermochemical uh, recycling uh, uh, using pyrolysis already in the 90s. And uh, he will give uh, a kind of a historic background. Um, and then the other session, uh, at the same day, we will have uh, another session on regulatory needs and developments. And there we have as speakers uh, Silvia Freni Sterantino from the uh, EUPC, so the Plastic Converters uh, uh, Society or uh, organization in, uh, 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 for Europe. Uh, Gerald Haag, uh, he is uh, uh, um, an expert uh, uh, from uh, Triskelion, uh, which is a research lab. And uh, Erwin Anis, uh, he is uh, working at ECA uh, in, uh, in relation to um, uh, packaging uh, and, and, and regulations there. All right, next slide. Um, so, and um, in relation to uh, this session, so this session is now, uh, uh, the keynote session is ending, but uh, the network session uh, is still starting. So uh, please stay around to connect. So you can go back to the network app um, uh, after this uh, this session, and then you can uh, either uh, go to the uh, uh, the network platform, but you can also um, uh, go to the um, the breakout sessions, which are part of the uh, network carousel. Um, I think that's in the next slide. Uh, so, uh, oh, sorry, <laughs> just go back, uh, Eva. Um, so, um, as part of this uh, this whole um, network uh, app, uh, so we have uh, you can make uh, appointments, you can uh, uh, you can uh, have a chat, uh, you can uh, connect uh, directly, and uh, you can also go to the exhibition uh, because we also have an online exhibition where you can uh, visit uh, kind of the booths there. Uh, well, it, it may be a, a nice experience uh, also to go there, and, uh, and and you can also interconnect there with the the companies. Okay, thank you. And then, um, so then we have the network carousel. Uh, there we have uh, three themes which we've put up, uh, where you can uh, can choose for. Uh, one is a, a competitive or sustainable business case uh, for uh, recyclates. Um, the other one is uh, from design. For recycling to recycling in practice and at scale, um, uh, and the second and the last one is uh, related to the Gruyfonds, uh, which was introduced also a bit by uh, Emil Meyer, and uh, what is then the way forward there? Okay, so you can uh, th those um, sessions will be 15 minutes uh, of uh, interactions in small groups of, uh, of 10 persons, and uh, there you also find the uh, the speakers. And, uh, and some of the organizers of, uh, of this conference. 
Okay. Thank you, Hans. Uh, so, uh, well, this this is then the um, uh, the end of the uh, network session, and um, well, um, please go to or uh, please go to the network session. Uh, this was the end of the keynote session. Um, go to the network session, which you can find uh, in the in the uh, uh, in the network app. Okay. Thank you.